Thank you. You heard the expression, it's good to be back home again. <laughs> this is great. And what a privilege it is to be here again. And it's hard to believe it's been five years. <clears throat> and if you look at me, you'd say I've gained 10 years. But if you look at Karen, you'd say she looks the same as she did five years ago. And it's amazing how time flies when you're having fun, doesn't it? And I appreciate your prayers for Eddie Swartz. <clears throat> Soon be 90 years old. He did our wedding ceremony almost 55 years ago and been a dear friend to us for many years. And we really uh, love and appreciate him and all he's done. And uh, pray for his wife, Louise. Uh, he told me that, that she uh, now she does not know who he, who he is. She can't recognize him or anyone that comes in, got real bad dementia. So just pray for her and, uh, and Eddie. But you know what? He's almost 90 years old, but he still travels all around. He'll drive maybe 200 miles on su every other Sunday morning. He stays at home one Sunday and takes care of Louise, and then his daughter will stay the next weekend. And so it's a miracle how the Lord is using him still, and he's soon be 90 years old. That's the way to finish, isn't it? We all want to finish well. And, uh, you know, it's, it's quite a, a, a contrast when we think about when we were young men, young ladies, and the energy we had then to the energy that we've got now. And uh, in July, I'll be 78. Or is it 87, Karen? I think it's 78. But I just praise the Lord for, you know, all that he's done for us over these last 55 years. And uh, I'll give you a quick update. Our kids, Lauren is still a missionary with Wycliffe Bible Translators. And she's living with us now and still able to work all over the world through Zoom meetings and, and uh, be able to computerize libraries anywhere it's needed. And our son, Wayne, he's still uh, in Memphis, Tennessee. And believe it or not, we've got a, a granddaughter that's graduating from college and a young boy who's 13 years old. And it's hard to believe how much water has gone under the bridge in this situation. But they're still serving the Lord there in, in Memphis and uh, just to help them. Well, <clears throat> I'm going to be looking at uh, First Peter. You know, Mr. Key told me that he had just finished a series on Second Peter, so I thought I would be first and let him be second. <laughs> but, you know, it, it's incredible, all of these precious books that we have got and the challenges that's in these books to challenge us the way we ought to live for the Lord after all he's done for us. And, you know, when we we think about these things, it's just a miracle. And, and Peter, you remember, Peter was a real strong man, wasn't he? Uh, he was, he was a, 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 a get-or-done boy. I'm going to raise this just a little bit because, believe it or not, I have had uh, cataract surgery since I saw you last about three months ago, and uh, I'm just recovering from that, and I can see much better, and y'all are very clear, but I can't see small print now. <laughs> so we've got a lot to be thankful for. Uh, you know, Peter was one of those guys, and you know, when you read through the Gospels, you read all about him and all of the energy that he had, and you know, he was a, we called him a get-or-done boy. He, he knew exactly how to get everything done. He knew all of the answers to everything, but he didn't always have the right answers, did he? And you know, I remember one occasion the Lord told him, when the Lord told him that he was going to Jerusalem and what's going to happen to him while he's there. And Peter said, no, I'll never let this happen. And uh, what did the Lord tell him? Get thee behind me, Satan. You don't mind the things of God, but you mind the things of the world. And, and Peter was like that as a young man with all of that energy. But what happened to him 
This letter was written in A.D. 65, and according to the, uh, you know, the, the books that I have and so forth, A.D. 65, that was only, what, 38 years later? And it's amazing when we look at this book now, and we look at how he approaches things totally different than when he was a fisherman. Now he's really a fisher of men, isn't he? And the Lord is greatly using him. But let's read the first verse here. And I'd like us to make some comments about these little, rather than read the whole section, we'll just read uh, a section at a time. And then when we get down to the one, the, the point about suffering and so forth, and our faith being tried, I've got some verses here that I would like us to consider at the same time. But look at Peter. It says here, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the pilgrims of the dispersion in Pontius, Galatia, Cappadonia, Asia, and Bethania. Peter, an apostle. You know, I think it's interesting that uh, he calls himself an apostle here in this book. But you know what he calls himself in the next book, in 2 Peter? How he introduces himself? Peter, a servant. Now, that's the way to do it, isn't it? <laughs> He's a sent one, and he was definitely a sent one. And uh, it's amazing what he did. He's, his name, Peter... It, it means uh, a rock, but he was not a chief cornerstone, and he was not the rock of the church, was he? There's only one foundation stone, and we know that there was only one chief cornerstone, and that was the Lord Jesus Christ. And you know, I think it's interesting in Peter's second sermon that he preached in Acts when he was talking to the men there, it says in uh, Acts chapter 4 and verse 11, it says, this is the stone which uh, was rejected by you builders, which has become the chief cornerstone. Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men, they marveled and they realized that they had been with Jesus. Now that's a good uh, indication, isn't it? He is preaching that there is no salvation in anyone except the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the only way, the truth, and the life, and no one can come to the Father except through Him. And that's what the gospel is all about, right? And Peter identifies himself as an apostle, a sent one. What was he sent to do? He was sent to tell people this great message that he proclaimed in, in uh, Acts chapter 4 about Christ being that one chief cornerstone and there's no other salvation in anyone else. And you know what? That's the best news that we can carry with us. Anywhere we go, we need to have something and to be ready to tell people how they can know for certain that they're going to heaven. Because there's so many people out there today that they don't have a clue. They have no, no idea. I can remember uh, we have even run into people who, uh, young people in high school, and you ask them, uh, uh, about do you know you're going to heaven when you die or something like that and we mentioned the name of Jesus well who is Jesus you know, I've heard his name at Christmas but who is he I don't know who he is and there's so many people out there today that doesn't have a clue who he is and what he has done for them and that's what we need to be sent ones and to be fishers of men and to be an illustration of what Paul or Peter is doing here and I think it's interesting that he wrote this letter to, to five different cities or, or, or countries that the people had been dispersed. And you know, it's interesting 
these five cities, if you look at some of the maps uh, there, if you were to go from Israel and go straight up, today it's modern Turkey and part of Asia there. And these five cities are found up there. If any of you would like a, a good uh, program on your little computer, uh, Bible encoding, and you can go to any book in the Bible, type in that book, and click, and it'll show you the country, and it'll show you every location loaded right there. And then if you want to click on the town or something like that, it'll take you to uh, Google Earth, and you can go there and actually look at the town and see what it looks like. It's, it's incredible. But Peter was a sent one, and he became a servant by the time we read the second book that he wrote. And, uh, and he uh, identifies himself in chapter 5 of this book. He's an elder. He's not the elder. He's not the apostle, but he's an elder elder. Now that's great, isn't it? Now in, had God designed the church to have elders? Not just one, but many. And it's great when we see this played out here. And, uh, and uh, I think it's also interesting that when the, I read that passage there in Acts chapter 4 verse 13 that the, the, the leaders saw the boldness of Peter and John. And they concluded, these guys are uneducated. They've never been to college. Isn't that amazing? They're untrained. Well, I can tell you what, they had the best trainer that ever existed for about three and a half years. They followed the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's the best Bible college you can go through is to go through the Bible and read it and study it for yourself. And you know what? You can go to college and learn all of the different things that uh, they want to teach you there and, and have bits and pieces of it, but until it's, it becomes a real part of your heart and life, you're not ready to preach it, are you? But Peter, he had lots of boldness. And it's this, it says it's two pilgrims. Pilgrims. Now think about that. And these people became pilgrims by persecution. And, uh, you know, isn't it interesting that when you look in the book of Acts, you see there that the, the, uh, by the time you get uh, into chapter 8 or 9 or something like that, I can't remember exactly what it is. I'm showing my age now. And, uh, but you know what? What was it that caused the believers in Jerusalem to go out to all of the different places. It was not a good life, was it? It was persecution. And isn't that amazing how God uses persecution and things that go wrong in people's lives to cause them to be willing to go out and to tell other people about the Lord Jesus Christ and what he has done for them. And there they were pilgrims. I think that's a good name, isn't it? Pilgrims. You know, there's an old song, I'm just a pilgrim, just walking through. This old world is not my home, I'm just passing through. And as we walk along, as we, the Lord leads us wherever we go, what do we need to be doing? We need to be willing to talk to people about the Lord Jesus Christ. And isn't it amazing how God takes people and moves them from one place to another so that they will hear the gospel? Isn't it amazing? I know God did that in my life. Back in 1969, I had a brother-in-law that uh, got killed in a motorcycle wreck. And I can remember when I went to the funeral home to see him with my sister. You know what? When I looked at that coffin and saw him there, I realized for the first time that if my body was laying in that casket, my soul would be in hell. And guess what? That's when I started looking. I became a real pilgrim, and the Lord brought me into Karen's life, and she shared the gospel with me the first time she ever met me. And she got learned that from her dad, 
who was a, a real gospel preacher everywhere he went. But that's what we need to do, right? And he was a great example to me, and I just appreciate all that I've seen. But, you know, you think about this, these, these people being dispersed, going to different places. And this book was written in A.D. 65. What happened in A.D. 70? <laughs> Jerusalem was destroyed, wasn't it? Titus came in and tore the temple down and took all of the Jews there captive and they were dispersed all over. And you know what? Sometimes God does that in our lives, doesn't he? He allows bad situations in our lives to wake us up to see we're not in control of anything. I don't manage people. You know, who's in charge? God is, isn't he? And we need to look to him and to remember what he's done for us. But look at verse 2 here. We have the work of the Trinity in this verse. It says, uh, to these pilgrims, and, and we believe they were, were believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, they were elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father in sanctification of the Spirit for obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace to you and peace be multiplied. Elect according to the foreknowledge of God. You know, God's the only one that really knows what's going on from the beginning to the end. He knows all about you before you were ever born. He knew every detail about you. And he knew what's going to happen in your life as you grew older and older. And, you know, he says, elect according to the foreknowledge of God. He knows all about you. How do you become part of the elect? You know, in the United States, I don't know when you'll have another election, but we'll have a, a big election coming up in November, and right now it is not something you want to talk about, <laughs> but elect. That's when you make a choice, right? In this situation, the people of the United States will make a choice who they want to be the president of the United States. How do we become elect children of God? How do we become a child of God? And I think it's uh, when we become a child of God, that's when we become one of the chosen ones. When we choose His Son, He chooses to do all these things with us, for us, and through us. You know, it's uh, amazing. When you elect Christ Jesus as your Savior and your Lord, what does the Father do? He says, I'm going to take you and I'm going to adopt you as one of my children. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. Now, isn't that precious? That's how you become a child of God. And you know what? You can get into a family. There's three different ways, right? You can be born in a family and uh, who does the work there? It's the Holy Spirit, isn't it? You can marry into a family and we've got some newlyweds here in this meeting. You can marry into a family, right? Or you can be adopted into a family. The Holy Spirit, born again by the Holy Spirit, right? We are the bride of Christ but we are an adopted son of the Father. Now, does it get any better than that? And you know what he says? You become sanctified in the Spirit. You're elected by the Father. When you choose my son, I'll choose you. And the Holy Spirit, you're set apart. That's what sanctification means. Sanctified. Now, we learned a little bit about sanctification during the COVID time period, didn't we? <laughs> what did everybody do 
in order to try to sanctify themselves from COVID. They didn't get, come into contact with anybody that had it if they knew about it. They wore a mask. They washed their hands 20 times a day, right? Isn't it amazing how the, all these things happen? But we're sanctified by the Spirit of God to serve the living God. You've been set apart from the world to serve the living God. Can you think of someone better to serve? Someone that knows everything about you but has forgiven everything you've ever done wrong. It's great, isn't it? We've been sanctified by the Spirit of God. And listen to what he says. For obedience. Oh, for obedience. That's what we, God wants us to be, right? And we'll see it later on in the next message. Being obedient children. Be like a little child that looks up to Dad all the time and says, Yes, Dad, what would you like me to do? Now, I know we're not little kids, but God wants us to have the faith of a little child, doesn't he? To look up to him and to say, Thy will be done, not my will be done. But look at what happened. And sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. And we'll see that in the next message, you'll see that we have been redeemed, not with corruptible things, but with what? The precious blood of Christ. The highest payment that could ever be made for anything was made for each and every one of us through that precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you know what I've noticed in, in my life, and I've noticed it in so many lives, when somebody gets saved and they want to live and glorify God, what do they have in their hearts? Don't they have a peace? You know, all the old things are washed away when they realize that they've been taken care of by the blood of Christ and you've been forgiven and you've been set free and now you can serve the true and living God. That's the way it should be, isn't it? And, and, and when we do that, grace and peace, when we are living for God and being obedient, grace and peace multiplies in our hearts, doesn't it? And now, isn't that what we all want? We want grace. Grace I should say mercy is when I withhold from you what you deserve. But grace is when I give you something you don't deserve. And what is it that was given to us as a free gift? We didn't do anything to earn it. We don't deserve it. God withheld the judgment that we deserved through his mercy, and he gave us the gift of salvation, the washing through the blood of Christ and taking away all of our sins and then bringing us into a relationship with Him. You know, it's great to be part of the family of God, isn't it? And you know what? Isn't it great to look around here and see all these family members? Now, we don't know each other real good, some of us, but you know, what's it going to be like? We've got all eternity to work together and to continue keeping on for the Lord. It's quite a blessing in it. And what we want is that grace. Lord, I want you to give me what I don't deserve again today. Right? For by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It's not of works or all of us would be boasting and bragging about it. But give us more grace. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. We can sing that every day, can't we? But look at what it says in verse 3 here. As a result of, of that, it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again unto a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. His abundant mercy, his amazing grace. He, we've been born again to a living hope. 
You know, there was a time in our lives where we had no hope, right? Can you remember times like that when you, you had nowhere to take your problems to? You didn't know how you were going to deal with your problems and so forth. I can remember in 1965, some of you not old enough to remember that far back, but I became 18 years old, and I decided I was going to leave home. I was going to leave my family and get away, and I was going to see the world and do it by joining the Navy. And I said, I'll never come back again. But you know what? It didn't take but three months of boot camp. And guess what? When I graduated from boot camp, I was ready to go home because of all of the, the crazy things I had seen and all of the discipline that I had seen in boot camp. I was ready to go home and get a big hug from my mother because she loved me. She wrote a letter to me every day. And back in those days, if you were in the, in the military, postage was free. And if you were in Vietnam, it was free. But you know what? That's what a living hope is. You know, I hope to see you again. You know, Karen and I were thinking about that when we got invited to come back down. We hadn't been here in five years. But it's a great hope to be, hey, we're going to be, be able to see friends that we're going to spend eternity with in heaven. It doesn't get any better than that, does it? And, and it's quite a blessing. And it was all made possible by God's stamp of approval on what the Lord Jesus Christ did for us on Calvary. And you know, the Lord Jesus said, it is finished. The work is done. The price has been paid. And the Father said, Amen, on Sunday morning when he raised him from the dead. And you and I have been given a living hope through that resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And what a day it's going to be when we get to heaven and, and we'll see him face to face. Well, look at the next one here. It says in 1.4 of 1 Peter, to, and, and here's what you're going to get, to an in, uh, inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that does not fade away reserved for you in for you in heaven, for you, an inheritance. Any of you looking forward to an inheritance? I don't see any hands going up. <laughs> you know, it's amazing how that, you know, many times our kids are, think about, you know, well, when mom, and, when mom and dad die, I get the house. I get, I get their car. I get all these things that they've got. It'll belong to me. That's what we think about, isn't it? And, and that's what we want, a, 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 an inheritance that's incorruptible and does not, it's undefiled and it doesn't fade away. You know, it's amazing. Uh, today, we look around and people who think that they've got a, an inheritance and all they got to do is look at their banking account and where is it gone? Is it fading away? <laughs> it's fading away, isn't it? And you know, it doesn't matter who your, your, your banker is or who your accountant is or uh, who's helping you with your finances. It goes downhill, doesn't it? Because when you stop putting in, it starts fading away. And now, isn't that how it, it works? You know, if you've got a, a savings fund, a 401k or something like that, you know when you've got to have all that money drawn out? You've got to be 115 years old. You've got to have it all drawn out. <laughs> how many of you think you'll live to be 115? There might be just a little bit left in there for you kids. But here he's talking about... Uh, we have got an inheritance in heaven that's not going to fade away. What a day it's going to be when we get to heaven and we'll be able to see that mansion that Jesus talked about. And you know what? That will be nothing. The possessions up there will be nothing compared to being able to see 
the one who died for us on Calvary and made it all possible. It's, it's quite a blessing here. An indefiled, it's reserved in heaven for you. If it, was on in, if it was on earth, if it was reserved for you in earth, you have a right to be worried about it. Because we don't know when things are going to fall apart, do we? But think about this. It's reserved for you in heaven. And I'll tell you a quick story here. I'm going to have to go fast to finish. I can remember when I was a, a young boy, uh, my dad, we rented, we were tobacco farmers, and we had no choice to do anything else because that's the only thing poor people could do. And we rented a farm, and then uh, we rented a farm next door, and the lady that owned that farm, 325 acres, she never, she lived by herself, and she told my dad, when I die, Mr. Denny, you're going to get this farm. I've got you, and I've got this farm in my will for you and your family. And you think about that. 325 acres of land? Could you imagine how, how valuable that would be on this island? <laughs> but you know what? Guess what happened? Miss Burton would come to our farm... Uh, and, and, and she would sit on the porch with us and talk and, and tell us about all that, that you know, she, she had and everything. And, and, and guess what happened to my dad? He died before she died. <laughs> he got nothing, right? But then she said, I'm going to give it to your, to your mom, Miss, Miss Denny. Okay, and guess what happened in that situation? Well, <laughs> when she died, it was amazing. My mother was in her li last part of her life, and uh, when Miss Burton died, guess who got the farm and everything that she had? Her lawyer and her banker. <laughs> but our inheritance, what we're looking forward to, where is it at? It's in heaven. We don't have to worry about having the wrong banker or the wrong lawyer or anything like that, do we? It's, it's in heaven, and it's reserved for you. And, and listen to verse 5. I love this. Who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Not only is it reserved, you're being kept. And it's not going to fade away. And when we get there, it won't be nothing compared to being able to see Christ and worship Him and thank Him for who He is and for what He's done for us. But look at what happens. We need something to, 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 to do something in our faith. You know, it says, uh, and I heard, I've got this expression on the outline, a faith that cannot be tested cannot be trusted. And we all need to be tested, don't we? And you know what? When you're in school, what do you have every Friday just about? What do you have at the end of the quarter, the end of the year? You have a big test, don't you? Now, what is that test? Why do they give it to you? The test proves that you were listening to the teacher you were doing your homework, you were studying, you were applying yourself to what you were being taught. Right? And because of that, you know what? You get a check mark, right? You know, our granddaughter, she's taken the, the, uh, the college test, I think this is about the third time, and every time she's taken it, it's moved her up, and she's getting another scholarship. And she's only got what? This is uh, April. Only got a month to go. Right? But that's what the purpose of the test is. To show us to reveal what's in our heart. You know, the book of Hebrews chapter 11 is a great faith chapter. And it says, Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. 
And we'll see a, a passage that deals with that later on in this passage here. But he says, In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials. And you know what? It's interesting when you think about that. In this you greatly rejoice. You know, I think Peter was not rejoicing the night he was crying. But after the resurrection, Peter greatly rejoiced for the trials that he went through in life and how that, you know, now he was using that as an illustration to show how much the Lord had done for him and how he was trusting the Lord for a little while. You've been grieved by various trials. And you know what that word various, it means multicolored trials. And, and uh, I think it's, a, it's so true that, you know what, the trial that you'll go through will be different than a trial that I'll go through. That's why they're uh, uh, various trials. And God knows exactly which trial to put into each one of our lives to show us what our faith really is. And that's what we want, isn't it? Now, they're grievous when we go through them. They're not fun at all. But isn't it amazing that when you can go back and look at it a few years later, and you can think, when I was in that valley... Oh, I could hardly wait to get out of that valley. But you know what? God's brought me up on a mountaintop now. And now I can look back through that valley, and I'm not worried about the next valley I'm going through. All I know is if I go down, I'm going to go up. And where's our last test is going to end up? We're going to end up up there, aren't we? He says that the genuineness of your faith being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tried by fire and may be found to the praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. It's amazing. Our faith is being tested. And what do we want to hear when we see the Lord Jesus? Well done, you good and faithful servant faithful. That's an indication that you're living by faith, isn't it? And isn't it amazing when you look at Hebrews chapter 11, all of those great warriors, how they overcome the situations in life by faith and trusted, trusting in God. Now, none of you have been asked to build an ark or anything like that, but we do have trials in life and God does call us to certain ministries, doesn't he? And whatever it is, I think we'll see it illustrated in so many of these passages in Scripture to how we should respond to them. And he says that we want to be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And think about it. Verse 8, Whom having not seen you love, though now you do not see him, Yet believing, you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory. And you're looking forward to receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. You know what? There's three aspects to our salvation, past, present, and future. Past is when we get saved, right? We're living in the present time right now, right? Of salvation. And God is, is working on our faith. He's conforming us to the image of Christ. And, uh, but, you know, we hadn't seen Christ, have we? We hadn't seen him, and we're living for him, and we want to be well-pleasing to him. And you know what? I think it's interesting that, you know, John said, you know, he told Thomas this, you know, blessed are you, you you've seen the Lord, but blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. We're part of that group, aren't we? And what a day it's going to be. What a day it's going to be. The end of your faith. Our faith will become sight. 
How quick will it happen? That quick. Our faith will become sight. And we won't need any cataract surgery or any glasses up there or anything at all. We'll have perfect eyesight when we see the Lord Jesus Christ face to face. What a day it's going to be. And I love that beautiful smile. <laughs> you remind me of my mother. She had a smile like that. But think about this. The salvation of your soul and the testing. And I've got some verses here. We won't be able to look at all of them because I only have 10 minutes left. But listen to what James, the brother of the Lord Jesus, says in James 1.12. Count it. My brethren, count it all into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. nothing. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives it, gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. We all lack wisdom, don't we? We have some uh, some ideas, but it's not all wisdom, is it? Sometimes it's my opinion. But when I go through these trials, all of a sudden it goes from my opinion to what he's trying to teach me through it. And then we, we see something uh, uh, spectacular in our life. We'll look at this more in detail in chapter 4 because chapter 4 deals with suffering. And, and look at what it says uh, in Romans 8, 18, the center column. I've got all these verses. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Again, what a day it's going to be. Look at Romans eight twenty seven. Now he who searches the hearts knows that what the mind of the Spirit is because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose, for whom he foreknew he also predestinated to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. God's doing a work in us, isn't he? Not on the outside necessarily, but on the inside in our hearts. And what a, a blessing it is. He's working all things together. You know, it's amazing. I go down to Pittsburgh Christian Village. Uh, some of you may have heard of that. It's a retirement community for, for believers. And uh, every time I go down there, there's a big room close to the, to the cafeteria and the, the fellowship hall and everything. And this, this room is full of puzzles. And you'll see people out there in their, their 80s, 90s, and there are people down there over 100 years old at those tables putting those pieces of the puzzle together. That's what is going to happen to us, isn't it? Isn't that what God's doing for us to conform us to the image of Christ? But look at another thing here. We'll look at it again, at it again in chapter 4. Uh, it says, Therefore, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same mind, for he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. That he should no longer live the rest of his time in the flesh for the lust of men, but for the will of God. Sometimes God lets us go through a struggle or a trial, and all of a sudden, what happens at the end of the trial? I'm going to stop doing that. I don't need to do that. You know, isn't it amazing how we do that? You know, I can remember when Karen and I first got married, she, uh, she didn't have a driver's license. It didn't take long she got a driver's license. And then we were able to get a little Volkswagen Beetle. 69 Volkswagen Beetle, and we both worked in Greensboro there, and we lived about 10 miles out of town in a little town called McLeansville, and, and uh, we'd leave, you know, for work the same time every morning, and, and, you know, usually Karen would beat me home. One day I was coming down the road, and I, I spotted her, spotted that little Beetle, 
And guess what I did? I put the metal to the pedal. A pastor came up in front of her, and the four-lane road went to a two-lane road. And when I pulled up in front of her, guess who I saw? A policeman. A highway patrolman. He came up past us, pulled me over, gave me a speeding ticket. You know what? I said, I'll never do that again. I'll never do that again. Now, isn't that the way it is in life? Sometimes when we go through suffering, we realize, I'm going to give this up. I'm going to give up. I'm not going to do that anymore. But look at the last one here. 1 Peter 2, 19. And we'll look at this one uh, more uh, next time. For this is commendable if because of conscience toward God one endures grief, suffering wrongfully. For what credit is it if when you are beaten for your faults you take it patiently? But when you do good and suffer for it, if you take it patiently, this is commendable before God. For to this you were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps, who committed no sin, nor was guile found in his mouth. He responded as the perfect example, and we'll see that in chapter 2. He's the perfect example of suffering. And when we look at him, and we want to be like him, you know, when we go through these trials, we can have a different outlook, can't we? Because we know who is in control. But let's just close with this passage here. I've got two or three minutes left. It says in verse 10 there, Of this salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently and prophesied of the grace that would come to you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ who was in them was indicating when he testified before the suffering of Christ and the glories that were followed. Now you think about the prophets. We heard a little bit this morning in Isaiah 52 and 53. Can you imagine what Isaiah went through? He wrote that being led by the Spirit of God. But did, could, did he understand what he was writing? I look back at some of the things the prophets wrote. They didn't have all these answers. They were being led by God to write these things. And, uh, and, and when you think about this here, that, you know, I don't understand it. Who is this talking about, Isaiah 52, 53? Take Isaiah 53 and look at all the, the he and the we in those verses. You'll, you'll have a, a great study if you'll go that and underline the we and the he. What we did and what he did for us. And again, you know, I don't, the apostles, they didn't understand it either, did they? They didn't understand it. And they didn't understand it until the third day. And, and the third day, they didn't understand it at the beginning, did they? But when they searched with all their heart, they got found the answer. And, and we, we don't have time to look at that all together. But it looks to what it says here. To them it was revealed that not to themselves, but to us, they were ministering the things which now have been seen, have been reported to you through those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Can you imagine how that what it was like for those apostles in those early days after the resurrection? How they took Isaiah 53 and put it together, Psalm 22, all of these great passages of Scripture in the Old Testament that, that told about what was going to happen to Christ. And think we've got the living book right here before us. It doesn't get any better than this, does it? And he says at the close of verse 12 there, even the angels desire to look into it. Isn't that amazing? We don't take our 
our prayers to angels, do we? We take it to the only one that can do anything to help us. Let's just thank him and praise him as we close in prayer. Father, we thank you this morning for your great love and mercy to us. Oh, Father, we thank you this morning for your son's willingness to come here and to take our place and to pay the debt that we owed you for all of our sin. And we thank you this morning, Lord, that we have been washed with the precious blood of your son without spot and without blemish. And we thank you this morning, Lord, that you have forgiven our sins because of what your son did for us and you have adopted us into the family of God. And we look forward to that day that uh, whatever trials and tribulations that we may go through here, when we see you, we want to hear you say, well done, you good and faithful servant. And we just thank you and praise you this morning for such an incredible plan of salvation we have in and through your son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you. If anybody would like to chat.